please put your hands together and give him a warm up. Right then, so um, I, I put this as, does anyone remember Yagni? Because when I look around the office, pretty much everyone is about 10 years younger than me. But I, no offence, but I think we're probably all a bit uh, longer in the tooth than my colleagues. So uh, I won't put it out too far. But I, I base this on something that Uncle Bob says quite a lot, which is that the number of developers in the world doubles every five years, which when you turn it around on its head means that they're, half the developers in the world have got less than five years' experience, which when they're building things like car brake systems and aeroplanes is quite worrying. Fortunately, I build a betting website, so I don't need to worry about that too much. Um, I'm going to start with a little story about when I started at Skybet. Uh, so back in March 2014, uh, I left working for a PR company called Finn, who were just the other side of town in the Round Foundry, uh, to go and start a new adventure as an engineer at Skybet. Now, at that time, I'd never really worked in a big organisation. I'd only ever worked for agencies, so suffice to say I was a bit nervous about it because these people had a reputation for quality and excellence, and they had a totally different way of working to me. Uh, I was very much hand-to-mouth project work where we'd go and pitch something and then deliver it the week later for less money than we wanted. Um, and actually now we were in a team where everyone had a say and the tech team actually seemed to have some control over the way that the projects were run. Um, one of the first things I got to do was to work on a feedback system. Uh, it was already in place, it was just some minor amendments really, but I thought this is my chance to make a mark here. As a software engineer with, with little status in the company, I thought I could go away and I could, I could work this into something absolutely amazing for the future. Um, so it all starts with this button, someone clicks it and then a little form pops up to, to submit your feedback. I took this away and I made an absolutely amazing abstraction on forms. So you could make any form you wanted. It could have all sorts of address fields, whatever. It didn't really matter. Any type of input you wanted. Um, but the simple fact of the matter was, at the end of the day, all they wanted was this. Um, so I'd spent about three weeks delivering it, and it was completely useless. <laughs> now, you might notice that this three-field form is pretty simple. And actually, it's pretty much the extent of all forms on the website and has been to the day um, that I stand here now. So, my code doesn't exist anymore. Someone de deleted it pretty much like the month after because it was totally needless and, and just wasting away in the corner of the, of the software. So I guess part of this is to understand um, why Yagni um, and, and how I've come to understand it. If I'd known this at the start, I think I might have been a bit better off. So always implement things that you actually need rather than when you foresee you need them. This is a really important part of this. We talk about performance a lot as engineers, and, and no code is fast code, but equally, there's fewer bugs in it, and it's easier to implement because you don't have to implement as much. Um, I think it's actually summed up a bit better with this picture, where if you want a bike, you don't need a NASA space shuttle. And it comes in the, this pursuit of, of one of the sort of key values of, of extreme programming, uh, which is simplicity. And actually, as an engineer, it's, it's quite difficult to sit down and say, I'm not going to do that because I don't, I don't think it will ever be used, or if it is needed in the future, I can add it then. People like to think about how they can make something bigger and better and more complex. Uh, and at, you'll, you'll see it every day at work with engineers where they, you say, can you please just add this, um, this CSS to this page? And they've come back and they've written a whole sort of payment system or something. Um, so the cost of this sort of thing, uh, I think we've briefly, I've heard a couple of conversations beforehand where people kind of know about this sort of stuff, but I'll go through it anyway. So obviously the cost of, of building too much stuff is, is obvious that you've spent time building it and people's salaries are being paid without any actual value coming back into the business. Um, but I guess less known perhaps is the cost of repair because more you're putting into a system, the more maintenance there is, the more overhead, the more likelihood of bugs. Uh, and the, the less chance that you're going to be able to leave it alone and hope that it'll, it'll be fine till the day you turn it off. Um, I guess equally obviously there's the cost of delay. So while you're doing this thing that you don't really need, there's something that you do actually need that isn't being built. And from an engineering point of view, perhaps we could highlight this a bit better in terms of the actual revenue that a feature receives after it's turned on to customers, if it ever gets turned on. Um, but it's certainly something that uh, I think most sort of um, project managers, agile coaches, scrum masters, whatever, will be keenly aware of. Uh, but the one I'm kind of interested to talk about today from an engineering perspective is the cost of carry. Um, it's probably less obvious because when you're writing code on a different feature to the one you've just completed, you might not be able to identify or highlight how much of what you've just written is impacting what's going to come in the future. 
And it might not even be the case that the same code runs when you write a new feature, but holding that complexity in, in your head as a developer and, and taking on the burden of having to read through all the extra lines of code to understand the system as a whole before you implement something new is, is quite in, in, it's an important thing to remember. Um, so the burden of what you've written will, will impress on the rest of the team in some format or another. Now, there are some dials available to make sure that you can turn this down. Uh, one of them is scope. It's fairly obvious. Uh, the other ones being quality and cost. Uh, and the last one being time. So from a, from a sort of a larger scale business like Skybet, um, it shames me to say, but I don't think cost is something that we particularly care about that much. Um, time certainly is. And quality is, you, you, there's no compromise on quality, really. Um, so scope and, and uh, time, yeah, probably just scope, actually, is the one that we rely on the most. And there are a few activities that we've undertaken in the past. I remember getting whisked away to London a few years ago to take part in this exercise by a company called What If, where they got somebody to stand in front of us who was our stakeholder, while we all went away and thought up some brilliant features to go with some, um, some project that they'd come up with. And then we had to go and present them one by one while the stakeholder decided whether it was inside the rope of scope or not. And as a, as a team, I guess this is something that we do regularly. We have planning sessions and we sit down and we do inceptions and we, we look at what we can leave out and we understand that that's a really important part of delivering value to our customers. But I guess there's a catch to this and it's probably one that engineering teams feel more than anyone else because it's the catch that when you don't have proper design and you don't focus on the, the sort of the software aspect and making it changeable and malleable, actually you're impacting, even though you might be following Yagni in some form, you're still impacting future developments and future feature work. Um, it's all about malleable code. So I'm going to talk about a little, another project that I've worked on in the not too distant past, which is refactoring some of our mobile applications. So, Previous to this work, uh, this is what our navigation looked like on the app. It's fairly straightforward, but the, I guess the critical point is that this is a whole web page. To get to it, you clicked a button and it loaded a new page, which when you kind of look at it in a cold light of day, seems like a crazy decision because it doesn't actually change that much. And if you're slowing down someone's browsing to find the thing they want because you have to load a page each time they click a button, it, se it seems a bit silly. So we put forward a task to change this um, so that it was actually embedded into the site rather than a separate page in its own right. Um, so now it looks a bit like this, where there's a typical um, burger nav at the top. And when you tap it, it slides out the navigation from the left-hand side. It is sort of loaded each time the page loads, but you don't notice that as a customer. Um, and it's, it's much more efficient. People are faster at getting to where they want to go. But the thing with this, when I've changed this, which is out, on the outset a seemingly fairly straightforward thing, you know, it's taking an existing template and instead of loading it as a whole new thing, it's just putting it into something else that already existed. There were 70 failing tests, more than, I, I can't remember the exact number because it is quite a while ago, um, which I guess in itself isn't that surprising because it's quite a fundamental feature to a website. But when actually you look at it and zero of them were directly related to the classes that I changed, that's a bit of a warning sign. And I felt a little bit like this, where I was going to be going in and trying to change the world because this, this needed a significant refactor. Fortunately, it didn't too much. I'm sorry for presenting something so nerdy at uh, an Agile meetup. But basically, what you can see here is that the two main things that control how this works are these files at the top, but none of the tests underneath it related to them. They're all kind of secondary. They do rely on that code in some form or another, but they aren't. The, the functionality that I needed to change to make those tests work was completely unrelated to the change that I'd made. Uh, and I guess this is kind of highlighted by the state of our dependency graph on that piece of code. <laughs> Yeah, I can't even fit it on. Like, it would go beyond the walls. It's, it's massive. And particularly like that over here, the abstract thing has a concrete thing with an abstract thing that goes to an event controller with an event controller with an event controller. And they all inherit all this stuff as well, which goes quite a long way down. So obviously, we've been building this. No one's outright set out to make this thing awful to work with or to misunderstand it or anything. But at the time, they were just implementing the thing they needed to. They weren't going above and beyond to make it some all singing, all dancing system. It was just one bit at a time, adding a little bit of value for customers. There's a critical part to this that Martin Fowler highlights in his, um, his post about Yagni, which is that people tend to think about it as the outward facing features, and then they, they, they just get that out and then they move on. 
but actually it, it isn't applying to how you would work with the software as an engineer to make it simpler to change later. Putting the extra little bit of work and spending 10 more minutes to refactor some work after you've written it is actually the most important thing you can do because you're not saying I'm going to write this functionality now, you're actually saying I'm going to write it later and it's not going to be too hard to write it later because I've taken the time to leave this in a good state now. So if we go back to revisit this cost of carrying, uh, these are some stats that we produce every month for our, our various um, delivery teams. And this is actually from, from my team before I left it um, in the start of the summer. Uh, and you know, JIRA and everything like that, they're, they're great for pulling out information. You can see how many tickets you've delivered, how fast you've delivered them, where the tickets sat for the longest, and what distribution of work there is in there. But what they don't really highlight is, uh, is how much value that you've actually delivered, because these tickets might be behind features or whatever else. But interestingly, what you can see is the impact of rushing to get things done, so taking the time out of the equation. They had to be delivered for a deadline. And you can see that in July 2016, and to some extent August 2016, there was an awful lot of work put in to deliver a piece of, soft, uh, piece of functionality called request a bet, which is sort of highlighted over on this left-hand side. And the impact that that's had, because of the effort that went into it, obviously the scope being what it is, we, we delivered what we needed to, we didn't go too far. But the impact on the following month's productivity and, and things further into the future are quite obvious when you see that September, gradually things, September, October, things get far worse in terms of how much work was delivered. It took us longer to deliver less stuff. And we were, a, we were a fairly solid team at the time, so it wasn't that we were putting more things into our tickets. We were actually, we were actually doing exactly the same upfront work to make sure they were sized appropriately and the relevant amount of work was being done. But teams, that we were burnt out, partly, but also, We'd, we'd spent so long rushing to get things out just at the bare minimum that actually making the changes we needed to were quite complicated and it took a bit of a time for everyone to get back into an even keel. Factor into this that you've also got something uh, that happens frequently in businesses, you know, people go on for new careers. Um, team members left, so we had to onboard new people. They spent a lot of time getting up to speed with how everything works. And because of the, the speed of delivery had impacted on what we'd, what we'd agreed and how we'd delivered it in, in terms of the design of the software, you can see how it slowed us down. Um, you can sort of see it a bit clearer here on this work type distribution. So the, the July and August period was really, really busy feature work and not very much on operational stuff. And I, I guess you could, you could roughly equate operational to us doing the right thing tech-wise, which is more refactoring. But then September and October, the balance shifted a little bit more to, op to operational. And then gradually, uh, as discipline went out from our JIRA reporting, we don't know what we did because it was all this gray matter. Uh, but we'll, we'll move on from that. One thing that I talk about quite a lot with, with people in the management of our, of our business is, is that they say about how many tickets we deliver, but actually how many features did we deliver? Or rather, how many features did we turn on or off? Uh, and actually looking ahead of tonight, I spotted that we'd probably only turned on about four or five different things to customers over the last month and a half. Whereas when you look at the number of tickets, all, th all things look great. Bearing in mind that a lot of this is to get feedback so we can decide what we're building next to get the right thing out for customers and achieve more value for us and them. Um, this kind of worries me a bit, but it's not the, the main focus of what I'm talking about. So underneath this, how do we maintain simplicity? Um, engineers have a lot of responsibility here. I think we've spoken about it briefly before about how they need to be able to communicate better to say why they need to spend the extra 10 minutes of, of time or extra half an hour, or however long it is, to make sure that they leave their, their work in a state that is allowing them to change it later. Um, and there's a few different things that come out of um, Kent Beck's book, Extreme Programming Explained, that have led on to other bigger movements uh, in tech. Test-driven development is something I feel really strongly about, but it's something that I don't know an awful lot of teams actually manage to achieve in practice. Um, it kind of underpins everything that I'm going to talk about here because it's really, it's really the only way that you can guarantee that when you're, you're making changes efficiently that they're still actually going to be correct. Um, there's a whole world of, of information about how we can write tests and, and, and make sure that our, co our coverage is appropriate. But I think a lot of times I talk to engineers at, at work especially, they get lost in understanding why they are doing it or they don't know how to get started because it's kind of like that. I don't know if you've ever seen the diagram of how to draw an owl where it's like two circles and then finish the owl. It's, it's like that. No one really goes into the detail of, right, well, this is how you get into the practice of writing a bit of tests, um, making sure it fails, writing the thing that, that makes it pass, looking at it, saying, is there a better way that this can work and refactoring it? 
Um, but this is extremely important. It underpins all the rest of them. I think Kent Beck puts it better than I can. Um, he paraphrases some philosophers who say that what can be measured, if it can't be measured, it doesn't exist. So software that can't be demonstrated by automated tests doesn't exist. And I, I think that I fully agree with that because especially when people change their jobs or move on from teams, no one remembers how it works and it just exists and no one really knows how it works. Following on from TDD, um, refactoring is, is so important here because it's about making sure you're leaving things in a state that allows you to, to change them later. Uh, I think this, this flexibility part at the end of this statement is really important, but actually the communication part is probably even more important. You spend more time at work reading code than writing it, and if it's impossible to read, then people are just going to ignore it and do something else. And that's where duplication occurs, or they start building things that, that don't really do what they need to when there's already something that exists. It's just a massive um, warren of, of problems for the business and, and for teams in, in general. Um, and I think Michael Feathers puts this really well, because people will look at legacy code especially and say, well, I can't possibly write new tests for this, or there aren't any tests, so I'm just going to keep like, hacking away at what's there without really thinking about the impact on the overall system. But actually, you're going to need to add stuff in the end. So if we, if we take the right path and write the test first, even if it's new functionality building on a, on a legacy piece of code, you can start to grow your system and, and get rid of the debt, uh, that, that tech debt word that we all love so much, without actually having to worry about whether um, you fully understand it or not. Because if you put tests in there, you've proven that that works. And as it goes away and it doesn't get used anymore, you can just delete it. It's a really important part there. Leading off from this, continuous integration. If you don't know how it's actually impacting customers or getting feedback on how things work, then um, what's it all for anyway? Uh, this is something that I think we are quite good at at Skybet. We do a lot of regular releases and integration. I don't think we've fully hit continuous delivery, which is probably my next push for everyone in, in my teams at least, because I want to see people able to push into a master channel, master branch, sorry, and get code out before the end of the day so that they're not actually leaving long-lived feature branches. Because we've got a big team now, right? Every time someone branches off, they're in immediately behind. And as that business grows at the rate we're growing, they're going to get so far behind that they spend more time working out how to integrate code than actually writing it. So for this, working with proper practices, again, the tests are really important underneath it all, and being able to deliver code daily, hourly, minutes, whatever, it's so important. Probably a lesser known part of, of kind of XP and, and the philosophy behind it is this metaphor idea. So again, it boils down to communication. If, you, if you've got a shared metaphor for what you're doing, a shared story rather, you can, you can talk about it in a, in a way that communicates intent and meaning. And, and you can understand how the system works based on something that is a little bit more tangible to you as a person. If you don't include these metaphors, then you end up with things being named in a really quite weird way. Uh, I think everyone's heard the phrase that there are two hard things in computer science. One of them is invalidating caches and the other one's naming things. So having a decent metaphor is really, really important. <laughs> Lastly, code review. So true XP would advocate that you're supposed to be pair programming. Everyone pair programs. You don't, in, you don't work as an individual at all. And I think in reality, a bit more pragmatism is needed. Uh, and actually, it goes against the nature of quite a lot of people, but having appropriate code review is really important, and it should be an, an absolute nailed on formal thing in your process. One of the things that I'm particularly interested in this, though, is this word positive, because everyone knows that engineers are nitpickers. You sit there and you look at a bit of code, and if it's OK and it works, you don't say anything. And if it's bad, you jump on it, even if it's something as simple as spacing or brackets. You know, it's, it's just the most ridiculous things. But this leads to a culture where people are afraid to share things and they're afraid to, to put their work out for review and they're afraid of what's going to come back at them. And actually, just doing something as simple as when you see something that's right and you're happy with it, writing down to, in, the, in the code review saying, this is great, this is how I would have done it, or I think this is a really good approach, or I wouldn't have thought of it like this, but it's good. Anything like that is, is such a massive step towards having the right mentality for people reviewing things and peering on their work. And it leads to the right sort of appraisal. So people are more willing to get feedback, and it will help shape the design of the system overall. Um, and then, I guess, lastly, uh, to wrap up, it's not really about Yagni this, but it's about XP. Um, and it's been around for quite a long time, but it's about this, this core thing. It's about making a bet that it's better to do a small thing now the right way than let us change it later if we need to 
than to boil the ocean and be really complicated and get on with too much stuff now that we're probably not going to need anyway. Um, and it's all underpinned by these four values that I've kind of continuously gone back to. Communication, simplicity, feedback and courage. And the courage comes from everyone, really. It's a part of, a part of this that probably doesn't get talked about enough. But it's being able to stand up and explain why you've done something or why you need to take the time and why you need to change something when there's obviously no change to the functionality of a system or there's no change to the actual value that customers will see. It's about the long-term health of your teams and about the long-term health of the project that you're working on. Um, and this stuff, I think, even though it's been coined for many years ago, I think it's 1996 this first stuff came out for XP, it still holds true for me, and it underpins a lot of the way we work now, even if you call it Kanban, Scrum, whatever. It's, it's all sort of the same sort of thing. Communication is really critical. Keep it simple and make sure that you're constantly releasing and changing things in small increments so you've got an understanding of how the system's working and what you're doing for your customers. And on that, thank you.